So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today for our career conversation. This is actually rounding out our, our career conversations for the summer. So we are thrilled to be, um, to be ending on a high note here with Lizanne Kindler, um, CEO of Talbots. Um, thank you again for being here today. We truly appreciate you taking the time. Um, and just a brief kind of background, and this is very brief, but just to kind of give everybody a little bit of, of, of a background from, from your, um, your bio that I've read as well, Lizanne, but you're originally from, from Denmark, where you did graduate from the um, Copenhagen Business School with a bachelor's in economics. Um, and you really began, began your retail career, it sounded like from Ann Taylor. Um, you also went to Talbots and then Kohl's and then where you currently are now as CEO. So it sounds like you've had a really exciting uh, career journey and we're really excited to hear about it today. So thank you again. Um, so feel free to take it away. Thank you. Uh, hi guys, thanks so much for um, having me. I know these are um, a little bit of a um, you know crazy moment that we're living through. Um, so um, excited to share with you guys uh, just a little bit of um, the way I'm thinking about it. Hopefully it'll be conversational, but um, I'll share with you guys a little bit about my career itself and then some of the, um, I guess, lessons learned that have been helpful, I think, as I have had the, um, the opportunity of retrospecting, which you guys don't have because it's all in front of you. Um, so I'll share some of that and then maybe um, some of um, a little bit of some leadership um, lessons that um, um, I have had through the years and certainly right now is probably the biggest lesson for me in terms of being a leader with the crisis that we're living through right now. And then um, I figured um, I'll, I'll give you some thoughts um, that I, I try to think about like if I was a student today and I had my career ahead of me and I was living through the pandemic, what would I tell myself? <laughs> um, so I'll try and give you guys some thoughts. Um, but again, hopefully conversational. So please um, chime in. I'll pause um, in between so that you guys can ask questions. Um, but as Emily said, you know, I've been in um, the world of retail for over um, 25 years. I won't give you the exact years because then I'll date myself. But, um, but it's been an amazing uh, career. I've loved every bit of being in retail. Um, I did start, I graduated business school of Copenhagen um, and, and I came to United States. But I knew, I knew already when I was 11 years old that I wanted to be in retail. It's always kind of been in my in my blood. I came to United States to visit an aunt in Washington D.C. when I was 11 years old, and she was president of a chain, a local chain of department stores that doesn't exist anymore. It was called Garfinkel's, and. She brought me into the office over the summer and she kind of walked me through both um, the corporate offices and um, customer engagement that she had. She, she took, brought me out to the distribution center and, and I just kind of got really enamored with the dynamics and the energy of, of uh, retail. And now this was very high-end retail. So this was also beautiful fashion and designer brands. And I thought, oh, this is exactly what I want to do. Um, well, I never ended up doing designer brands, um, but, but that's a diff different story. Um, and, and I think part of probably what I also um, watched and where um, my aunt really inspired me was that she um, had such a command of um, her team and of the customers and of, of retail and of fashion and she just exuded such um, leadership. Now I was 11 years old. I had no idea what that was, but I was watching it happen in front of me and I came back home and I said to my parents, um, that's what I want to do. I want to lead some fashion company. I didn't exactly say it that way, but um, so when I graduated um, Copenhagen Business School, I um, made my way to New York City and I started working for Ann Taylor. I joined their um, training program, which I think I was the first official trainee of Ann Taylor back then, um, and started out in stores. And then I made my way into the corporate office and and had a, was fortunate enough to land a track in merchandising or buying. Um, and I did that for an, an and that really became sort of my main track through my career. And I um, stayed with Ann Taylor for 15 years, which today is, you know, very unusual that anybody stays that long in one company. But um, the reason that I ended up staying there for so long, and this is probably very much part of what has fed my career, 
is that um, I moved. I moved around a lot. So I did Ann Taylor, and then I actually um, followed one of my leaders into Loft um, when Loft launched, which today is a huge business. But you know, when I started, it didn't exist. Um, so I was part of the team that figured out how to build that business and grow that brand. Um, after that, I actually got sidetracked and went into um, antella.com. We were launching .com. And so many times during my career, um, I found that people would say to me, why are you jumping from what looks like a really great job in a, in a, you know, really great space to something you don't know anything about? And, you know, who's going to, what do you, how do you know people are going to buy online? Like, why are you going to be part of that team? And I didn't, you know, know if that was going to happen, but I, um, I felt like it was an exciting opportunity and it gave me some an opportunity to learn something very different. Um, so I jumped into antella.com, ended up going back to Loft and grew um, as, a, as a GMM Loft to over a billion and over 500 stores. It's amazing. Um, so really had some fun movement in my career, even though it was like 15 years with one company. It didn't feel like 15 years with one company. And then I left and went to Talbots. Um, I was recruited to head up merchandising for Talbots um, with a new a new group of leaders and a new CEO to the Talbots business. And at that time, this was 08. Um, at that time, the business had been, um, it had gotten really stale. It was very dusty, um, but it was positioned as a turnaround, but it really wasn't a turnaround. The financials of the company were fine, but the brand had just gotten a little stale. Well, because it was positioned as a turnaround, the leadership team came in and we just went at it and we made huge changes because we were turning it around and we were going to make it a very exciting new business. Um, but we ended up, um, having a lot of conflicts in terms of the direction of the business and the CEO was very hands off. And she was like, you know, I had a lot of great executives. You guys figure it out. Lesson learned. That's not leadership. Um, FYI. <laughs> so, so for me, that became very challenging because I felt like I had to fight for what I believed in and I didn't really have the support. So I ended up leaving the business. And when I was leaving Talbot's, um, I wanted to try something different and I wanted to position and learn um, something different. So I ended up taking a job with Kohl's out in uh, Milwaukee and Kohl's is a, a, is a low end department store, as you guys know, and I was running, hired to run the private exclusive brands and it was somewhere around um, $9 billion worth of volume. It was huge. And I was running the design, product development, sourcing, technical design, all areas that I had actually never um, run in my career. Um, and for, you know, 26 different brands, um, which was amazing and a huge learning experience, you know, a fortune 500 company, very robust um, in terms of sales and financials, um, top talent in the industry but I learned a lot about myself. I learned that I really like being in a single brand business where I can dig really deep and where I can create a connection between the brand <clears throat> and the customer. And what I learned at Kohl's was that I was flying very high in terms of what I was touching and what, what I was involved in. And I also learned that I wasn't running the business and I really missed that. I missed not being the person who was making the financial decisions on the business. Um, so Sycamore Partners called me when I was sitting out in Milwaukee um, and I had actually just been with the company for a year and um, just moved the family. They called and they said, hey, you know, we're going to buy Talbots. And um, we heard that you had very opposing views in terms of where to take the business. And we'd like to talk to you. I said, I'm not going anywhere. I just moved to Milwaukee and I have this amazing job in a Fortune 500 company. And I was flying all over the world and staying at, you know, beautiful hotels and everything was great. Um, but I did realize I took a conversation with Sycamore Partners and I realized that I really was missing kind of running the business and I was missing being with a single brand. So I ended up making the move and um, 
started uh, at Top. It's my second time as um, president of the company in 2012. And at that time, the company was really in distress and it was a turnaround. The company was bleeding money. It was um, running, um, trailing 12 months, negative $50 million of EBITDA. It was very challenging. Um, team was hugely demoralized. So I walked in the door and rolled up my sleeves and just got at it. And we worked really hard for um, several years to turn the business around, which we succeeded in doing. And since then, uh, we've grown and grown and grown. And it's been an amazing experience uh, with a very, very talented team. And now, boom, COVID-19 hits. And um, last year, we closed out our uh, largest revenue and largest profit year. And then came the crisis. Um, so I'm going to talk about that in a in a minute. Um, but I'm going to talk about a few sort of my lessons learned in in my career. Um, but I'm going to pause to see if anybody has any questions. No. Okay. So so one of the things that I learned. Um, I've learned about myself in my career that I think has been very helpful is I've, as I've grown in my career, I've always set the goal of what the next thing was that I wanted to achieve. What I've learned is that that path in terms of how to achieve that is not a straight path. And I thought, you know, once I got in a track, I was going to stay in that track and things were just going to work out for me. And it was going to be a very straight line to, for me to hit all of my goals. And um, I think looking back, um, I would say that where and when I had detoured and I thought, you know, I was going to land in a company and this was going to be my home and here I was going to have my career and then things didn't quite work or I made a detour and I did something different. Those have actually been the moments where I would say I've grown myself the most and I've challenged myself the most. And they have, those moments have contributed to me being a stronger leader in, in the, well, particular in the moment that we're living in right now, but in general, um, so I would say that not being afraid to take a little bit of a detour and not always banking on that line being straight as you go through your career is actually really important because I think it's very few leaders that have a straight line um, and you do end up having bumps in your career and you do end up thinking, wow, this wasn't what I thought. The other thing that I've learned in that aspect is that I, I am very good at making um, decisions. And once I see something that I think is going to be good, I make a decision to go for it. But I also always give myself permission to change my mind. And when I keep that power to myself and I empower myself to allow myself to change, then that makes me feel like my decision is not permanent. And I can feel free to take, make a step and make a move and know that I can always go somewhere else or I can always do something different if it doesn't work out. Um, and I think a lot of people have a track and then they stay on the track. And then if it doesn't quite work, they, they're just committed. They're just going to stay on that track um, and try to figure it out. And I've always just said, hey, you know. I hold that freedom. Um, I make that decision myself. So if I go and it doesn't quite work out, it's my decision to say that I'm going to go somewhere else. Or it's my decision to say that I'm, I'm saying this isn't right for me and let's do something different. Um, and I think that that gives, um, when you know that you hold that power and you give yourself the freedom to make that decision and then change it, I think that that allows you to take some risks because you think, okay, I'm taking a risk, but it's not forever. Maybe it will be forever. Maybe this is the thing that I'm going to do the rest of my life, but maybe it's not. Um, and I think that that's very, um, it's very empowering, I guess I would say in a lot of ways. Um, the other thing is I would say all the way through my career, one of the things that I have um, probably learned the most from is how incredibly curious I am and how much I ask and how much I seek um, and working with talented people all around me and just having that curiosity factor, asking a lot of questions, um, wanting to know, even if it's not my area of expertise, I've always looked 
at other areas of business to say, oh, here's someone who's really good and really talented. And let me ask, let me figure out like what that is and how that works and, you know, what I can learn from that. And that's both in terms of functional talent, as well as just um, also making observations around um, leadership and management skills. I think that that's something that um, as you go through your career, you start to get to know yourself and your triggers and what you're good at and how you like to lead and how you like to manage. But when you watch people around you, people that have seniority, people that have done things maybe differently or longer than you have, you pick up cues and you start to watch how people are responding both good and bad. Like you watch a leader and you see, wow, this person got such a positive response when they did this or said that, or um, you know, had a gesture or an idea, the way they positioned it or they influenced. And then you start to pick up on like, oh, okay, well, maybe I should try to use that, or maybe I should apply that methodology myself. Um, and I've always been very open to, I've never believed that I'm just a product of only myself, but always believe that I'm a product of picking up what people around me do well, but also saying, ooh, this got a really bad response, or nobody liked that, or nobody's responding good to that particular way of influencing, so let's not ever apply that. Um, so it goes both ways. It's both good and bad. Um, and I guess I would say alongside with that, um, thinking about how you um, align yourself with mentors or people in your life that can be good um, role models for you. And that doesn't always have to be someone that you're working with. You know, it could be someone in life, someone if you, you know, if you have a sport, if you have a, an organization, if you have a passion, um, if you read a lot, you know, it could be all kinds of mentors and role models. Sometimes, um, um, they're good when they're in your life because you can ask them questions. Sometimes they're aspirational role models that you just observe from a distance and you think, wow, this is a person that I really want to emulate or I want to pick things up from. Um, so I would say that curiosity and that learning um, is really, really important. Um, and then as, I, as I've grown in, in my track as a leader, um, I've also come to know myself very well. Well, and I think that that's really important as you begin your career because you want to understand where's your passion, what are you going to be excited about, what what's going to drive you, and then alongside with that, when you um, when you start to know yourself, you also can hone in on your own strengths. Um, so I would say to you, if somebody asked, you know, what do I bring as a leader? Probably three things that people would say is that I'm a really I, I'm really high in focus. I focus very much. I go into a situation and I do it wholeheartedly. I'm not distracted. I'm not on my device. I, I'm intensely focused, which means I actually get a lot done in a short amount of time because I'm not distracted. Um, I'm a good listener. I love asking questions. I want to know what are people thinking because I don't think that I always have the answer and I don't think that I'm the only one that knows and I know that I need to know what people around me are thinking so I can make the best decisions. So that ability to listen is really, really important. And then lastly, I would say people would say to you, I'm a, I'm a very big decision maker. Like I, I, I'm not afraid of making decisions. And again, Part of that is because I know I can change my decisions. <laughs> so I'm not afraid of making them because I know even in business, I can, I can make a change. You know, if I make a decision, something doesn't work out, you know, I'm very transparent. Hey, we tried. It's not working. Let's change it. So I think that those are three things that people would say. So I've gotten to know myself and I know that those are three things that I can really lean on. But then conversely, I also know what I need to surround myself with, right? And what is the talent I need to lean on, again, where I fall short or where I am not strong or where I don't know. So team and talent becomes really important. So I'm going to pause there for a second to see if there are any questions. Hi, I have a question. <laughs> so Hi, I'm going to be a sophomore this year, which means yeah. I have to pick a major of sorts. And like you mentioned, you graduated with an economics degree. And then as your career started developing, you went into different areas of expertise that you didn't necessarily know too much about or studied. If you 
were to change your major to maybe be a little bit more encompassing of what you did throughout your career, what would you suggest or what do you think would have been your track? Yeah, I think, and I happen to um, have someone who's in, in, in the major moment of pick, you know, having gone through the idea of what majors to pick. And I think if I was, if I was at Whitman, I think I would pick the triple E just because I think that entrepreneurship is one thing that really would have prepared me for multiple aspects of what I'm excited about today. Um, but I am also the person who would say to you when you're studying, pick the thing that excites you when you're studying, because honestly, it doesn't always apply. Trust me, I have come across so many people in business that have degrees in theater, that have degrees in communication, that have degrees in um, biology. I, I, I can't tell you, it's, it's strange how people fall into business um, with all kinds of degrees and then they find their passion and something in what you're studying is going to apply. Um, and I think... Um, as you find that passion, you land something, you'll also understand as you grow in your career that oftentimes the thing you thought was the reason you joined an industry, you're going to get further and further away from, right? So I sit here today and I love retail. I love fashion. I love product. And if I get to spend a day with my guys calling around, mapping out a catalog and moving product and creating stories, it's the best day I can have. But I don't have a lot of them. Most of my days are financials, it's people, it's leadership, it's tough decisions, it's, um, it's operations, it's real estate. Um, and those were things that I didn't know anything about that I didn't think I was going to be managing. But I like it. I'm having fun with it, right? So I think that you, you're going to, as you grow in your career, it'll take you into different situations where if you try to map to what you think ultimately your outcome's going to be through your studies, you might miss the thing that you really love. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. I have a question. Um, yeah. You mentioned how valuable mentorship is, and I work with students who want to explore mentorship, but they're kind of fearful of making that initial outreach. Uh, what advice would you give to a student to kind of overcome that fear of charting into the unknown? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I, I think for most most people that sit in a middle management leadership situation and up, they know nothing better than to mentor, right? Like how amazing is it for someone to ask you for advice that someone thinks that you might know something that's valuable? Like that's so, that's such an honor. So I would say, don't ever be afraid um, of asking. And if somebody says, no, hey, go ask someone else. <laughs> you know, um, I, I would not be afraid of reaching out. Um, I think um, most, most, um, I, I'm in the field of business. Most business people would think that it's an honor to mentor someone and to train someone or pass along good advice or be there when somebody needs help. Um, so <clears throat> I would not be afraid. Now, this is actually on my list in terms of thinking about like, what would I tell myself today um, in this current moment that we're in? Um, and it is, it is a good opportunity to try to find someone that you can connect with who's out in business somewhere, whichever field you might be interested in, see if you can find someone that you can learn something from right now, because the situation is very challenging and there's a lot to be learned. So I do think it is a moment where if you can connect with someone that can become a mentor and that might actually help also as you met, you know, make your way through your studies and you start to graduate, that's, it's helpful to already be connected and have some, some call it network slash mentorship in a field that you might be interested in. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I, so, I well, go okay. ahead, Allison. I'll go after you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when we work with students, we're often coaching them on how to market themselves and position themselves. 
to go into maybe even their first role and they're very nervous because they don't know if they have the skills that the employer's looking for or they've read the job description and only see one thing on there that they're even familiar with. You mentioned when you went to Kohl's that you had never worked in those certain areas before. So how did you get that job? Like what advice do you have for students when they're looking yeah. at that post and they're thinking, this isn't me. You know, I think no, it's great. It's so funny. I feel like you guys have read my list of what I was going to say in terms of good tips. Um, so it, it, it's very interesting because one of the things that I think is so important when you're out there and you're trying to position yourself, you, you have to practice interview. You, you must, you, you really must. And, and just pick someone, it doesn't matter who, and tell them to shoot a lot of questions at you. Um, because articulating yourself and articulating your strength is so important. Even if you don't have the actual skill set for the job, or if there are components that you have skill set for and others that you don't, being able to tell an organization what you as a person, as a, as a human being might bring to the organization, whether that is multitasking, communication, whether that's, um, you know, digital skill set, whether it's a, um, a passion for something or um, a tremendous amount of um, passion and energy in, in, a, in a particular area that you've learned. It could be language skills. It could be anything. But if you can find the nuggets that describe you as a person. So I didn't get the job at Kohl's because of my skills. Because I'd never run design. Like if they were looking for a head designer, they would have never hired me because I don't design. But what I was able to articulate to them is my ability to work with people, my ability to inspire people, my ability to lead, my ability to stay focused, stay organized, be communicative and drive results. And they were looking for more leader than they were looking for actual raw skill set. And I find oftentimes almost no matter what the level, um, organizations are almost looking for more of what you bring from a, um, I'm saying leadership, but again, like it could be any level, but what is the inherent um, personality traits that you bring to a team or to an environment or to a process? You know, if you are very detail oriented, that could be a huge win for an organization that might be looking for someone at a level, at a more entry level, but someone who can support an organization and catch things you know along the way so where whatever your traits are and things that might help you on that could be there's a lot of um you know leadership personality tests that you can take out there um and um i i was just comparing notes with someone um the other day who took uh one of those tests and it's very telling and it gives you a lot of words that you start to understand about yourself and those are words that you can use in an interview situation so i think that that's that's a good tool get to know your own strengths and what you bring um, and, and put it into words that make sense in a business situation. Perseverance, assertiveness, um, communication, you know, those are things that you might have without ever having worked in, in a leadership role or a managerial role, but you might naturally just bring them because that's who you are. And that could be the thing that hooks you in the job. To add on to that, I, I was curious about, you know, you had mentioned you're a very decisive person, you, you know, give yourself that permission to make changes as necessary. And do you feel like that's a trait that you had always embodied? Or is that something over the course of your career, you felt like you um, built with that confidence of the experience you had gained? This is kind of twofold question. And also with the changes you made, you had mentioned that um, Ann Taylor, for instance, over the 15 years, you changed in a variety of ways. Yeah. Were those opportunities that presented themselves to you or did you seek them out and because you had that confidence of knowing you could make that transition? So kind of twofold. Yeah. So I would say that I have always been somewhat decisive but I never used it as a real muscle until later in my career. Um, and it actually most 
it really unleashed when I walked into the role at Talbot's and the company was really distressed. And one of the Sycamore partners um, said to me, hey, you're gonna be faced with a million decisions every day. The most important thing you can do is make them because if you don't make them, you're gonna stifle the organization. You're gonna, you're gonna um, drag things out. People are gonna get confused. They're gonna start to doubt where you stand. Um, if they're wrong, change them, but don't not make them. And I think that that really um, unleashed in me the, um, the lack of fear of making decisions, right? Because it, it can be very daunting when you're standing in front and you're making big decisions. And that's whether it's on a personal level or in a business situation, it could be daunting, right? Um, I'm sure for some of you guys, like maybe it was daunting to finally choose which school to go to, right? Like you probably had multiple choices and you're like, I could go here, I could go here. How do you know? Well, I don't know, you just make the decision and you go, right? And if it's wrong, you transfer. Same thing, right? Like, so eventually you make the decision and then you, you transfer. So I think, um, again, like if I was looking at myself today, 25 years ago, I would say, don't be afraid of making the decisions, just go push because it's, it's really, you can change them. So it, it strengthened as I grew in my career. Um, and then I would say that um, my track at um, actually all the way through has been a combination of seeking things out, but also um, because I am such a strong relationship builder and the mentors that I've had in my career, I've always stayed in touch with. Like I have never um, the proverbial burnt any bridges. Um, and so people came and sought me out and said to me, hey, we're starting this new division and tap, tap, I really would like you to come with me and help me figure this out. Um, so it's been a combination. Um, and um, as I've grown in my career, you know, uh, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, leaders often get calls from recruiters. And um, I would say that I have always taken them. I have always shown an interest um, because you just never know, right? And a lot of people say, well, I'm very happy in my job, so I don't need to talk to anyone. Um, but I like to just stay very broad and open because you never know. You never know where it's going to come from. Um, so I think reaching out, being open-minded, seeking it out, but also um, being open to when people approach you because maybe that particular thing isn't right but then they keep you in their minds and then something else comes back and then you go back and say oh yeah now i'm ready so it's both yeah thank yeah. you i have a question Hi. um <laughs> first of all thank you so much mrs kindler for sharing all of your pieces of advice i have a question more in regards to going from leaving Coles and rejoining talbots um, in a time where it was just stress compared to when you were in Ann Taylor and going for more entrepreneurial roles, going for the dot com, that was more unknown, whereas Talbot was very distressed. How was that decision to wanting to take on a new role and learn, knowing that you're already in a sticky situation? Yeah. Well, great question, Jolie. So I think um, what you what I did was I did a lot of homework. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that um, that that's a very good point to remember because any situation that you walk into when you look at a company at the surface you don't really know um, you don't really know what's going on there so i talked to a lot of people in the industry about you know could this be an opportunity is it real could talbots be turned around is it too far gone what should i think about um, when i was talking to the private equity company that was going to buy talbots we i spoke to them a lot about like What's the plan? What happens if this doesn't work? Like, or is the company still gonna survive? What are the financials going to be? Um, so it was risky without a doubt because the company could have, instead of us turning it around, it could have gone the other way. Um, but I felt so confident um, in the partners that I was talking to at the private equity firm. They had done so much due diligence around what did we need to do on contract negotiation? What did we need to do on real estate? And I was asking them all these questions. I didn't know anything about it, but I wanted to hear what they said. I wanted to make sure that logically to me, it made sense and that it sounded like it was realistic. Um, so it was, it was a risk, no doubt, um, but I felt like I had done sufficient homework 
to know that there was a very real chance that it could work. Thank you so much, Randy. Yeah, I welcome. appreciate it. The other thing I would say also, which was very interesting, because one of the things you want to know when you're get it going into a job, you know, I oftentimes say to people that a job is a job, but the biggest difference, it's the people that you work with. And I knew, because I had worked with the team, the leadership team at Talbots, that mm -hmm. I was at odds with them. So one of the things that I wanted to know when I was taking the job was that I was going to have the freedom to make the changes that I needed to make in terms of team and talent. Um, and they were very supportive of that. And then I knew I could probably recruit some people in that I could mm -hmm. rely on and that I knew from my past career that could be really great partners for me. Thank you. Yeah. I was just going to add to that. And of course, if it didn't work out, you got to make a change again and go in a different path, right? You know, that's yeah. the video. It, was, it was certainly a learning experience. That's for sure. I learned a lot those first two years. Um, and actually, which probably leads me to pivot a little bit to what's happening in retail today, um, because it is, it is for anyone in the country, on a personal level and on a business level, it's the most challenging time that we've faced in um, a century. Uh, it's, it's really pretty um, scary, I, I think, in so many ways. Um, and first of all, you guys, I'm saying this as a, as a mom, you need to take good care of yourself and be very careful as you're out there. Um, but um, from a business perspective, you know, we closed out Talbots with the best year that we've had in, um, in the history of the company last year, 2019. And we are going to close out this year um, far, far worse than when I walked into the company in 2012 and it was distressed. Um, the, the positive is that over the past eight years, we've built a foundation and we have a lot of strength that we can pull from. Um, the bad news is that this is a macro situation. It isn't even about whether someone made a bad decision or we bought too much inventory, we picked the wrong trends, we didn't mail the right catalog, like nothing. It was just a macro situation that we were thrown into and we had to make some very, very, very quick and very drastic um, decisions that we had to make for the company in terms of how we managed our financials, in terms of the size of our team, in terms of, and first we thought, oh, we're going to close down our stores for two weeks and then, you know, everything will be fine. Well, here we are. It's going to be almost five months later and um, it's still challenging. It's still a very challenging situation. Um, but a couple of things that I was able to draw on um, from, from my early uh, learnings at Talbots was, again, this sense of urgency, um, quick decision making, um, not being afraid to go deep and go drastic, uh, and then saying, okay, hey, we can always pull it back. Um, and that is in whether... Um, you know, we were some of the first ones to decide to close our stores nationwide. We were some of the first ones to decide to shut our home office. We were some of the first ones to furlough. We were some of the first ones to make salary cuts, some of the first ones to have to do a round of layoffs. So all bad things, all things that no one as a leader ever want to do, um, but all things that have been critical and important for us to ensure that the company survives and that the folks that are going to be here will have a job and then hopefully will enter into the new year and we will be able to start to hire some people back. Um, but it's been very, very challenging. And I would say these have also been times where um, I have leaned on um, listening, listening a lot to the organization. Where's the anxiety? What are people nervous about? What's everyone saying? Um, and communication, 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 and transparency, being very honest about how challenging it is and how tough it is. Um, so I would also say to you guys that, you know, this is, this is a scary moment for any industry, for any business, but it will come back. You know, we will get to the other side and retail is probably going to look very different. Um, when we get to the other side, there will be fewer companies around. Um, there will be different companies around, but the companies that will be around, they will grow. 
and they will be successful. Um, and there will be a need for associates to join um, the businesses. And there will also be, there will come a moment where there's going to be a huge need for new ideas and for new inspiration. And the companies that are willing to take those chances and are starting to think about what's life going to be in this new world? You know, how are we going to manage omni-channel? How are we going to manage stores? How are stores going to be relevant? How are we going to manage um, our associates? What about work from home? What about all those folks that love to be together and, and collaborate and brainstorm and touch things and move product around and crawl on the floor? Like, are they going to stay home forever? You know, how is that going to work? So, so there's a lot of, um, I think in 2021, there's going to be a lot of opportunity. There's going to be a lot of possibilities out there because everyone's going to start to think about those that are around are really going to be focused on how can they grow and how can they take market share and how can they be even more important than what they were pre-COVID-19. So those are big, big opportunities. And I would say to you guys, if you can look out um, in, on the environment and be inspired, think about how you as a consumer, how you as a shopper like to engage and then think about how that might translate for any company out there and what are the skills or the talent that you would hone in on if you were to be in a situation where you could support a company to be even stronger. I would say try to think about that in terms of what you're reading, what you're studying, what you're, um, and when I say studying, I don't necessarily mean classes, but I mean anything that you're studying, even if you do your own online research, um, um, who are you talking to? How are you putting yourself out there? Um, I, would, I would really think through. Um, I had a, 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 someone sent me an email, or our head of design sent me an email yesterday. One of his designers apparently has a, 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 an incredible um, digital talent and she she was been furloughed um, and she's not back working yet she's a project at home she went through our entire website and she repositioned she created a Talbot's app she went in she said here are the things that I think are not great about our website here are the things I would change and not just on a desktop but mobile so she showed me two versions and she created an app and she put in why she thought an app was going to be important for Talbot. Well, guess what? I need her off furlough and I need her back in the business. And I don't know if she should be designing clothes in New York. Maybe she should move to Hingham and participate with the digital team. So super impressive. Um, and she just did this on her own. Um, Maybe she was a little bored being furloughed. I don't know. Um, but clearly she had a talent outside of designing clothes. Um, and she just put herself out there and she said, hey, I'm going to take a chance. Here's what I think. And she sent it. So that was really impressive. So I do think that there are ways for you to think about how you can, as a, as a student, as a consumer, as a, as a shopper, you know, you can put yourself out there and you can start to think about, like, what would I do different? What are the things that I like? What are the things that I appreciate? Or if I see a company that I might be interested in, what are the things that they're doing that I think they shouldn't do or they should do different? Um, and start to map it for yourself. Start to have an opinion. Just start to think about it because that starts to train you in terms of maybe questions that a company would ask or suggestions you could bring to an interview situation. Um, so I think that there are things you could also... Um, you know, not everyone is in a position where you either have time or financials, but volunteering and finding out if there are places where you can pick something up that could be supportive. Now, that could also just be an organization. Now, I'm going to use as an example, um, Talbot's has a huge partnership with Dress for Success. Obviously, you know, they too are in a financial situation where they have to pull back and they're trying to fundraise in a moment where, you know, people don't have a lot of money to give. Um, and they're looking for, you know, how do they outreach? How do they get in touch with people? How are they thinking about social distancing in the centers? How do they give career advice to their clients so that they can train them to go back in the job market and they have to do it online? So these are organizations where, you know, if you volunteered for an organization like that, they would say, okay, well, help us figure this out. 
Like all of a sudden now we have to train our clientele across America and get them ready for Zoom interviews. Like how do we do that? So I think that there are ways that you can think about gain, getting some knowledge and maybe learning some things or contributing in a way that maybe you just, na it's just natural to you guys because this is how you live your life. Um, but for a lot of big companies and organizations, it's not. And that's where you guys could, could really bring um, some very interesting perspective and talent. Great. We can open back up. Are there other questions from any students that, that wanted to ask? I guess I have one more question. Yeah. Um, and this really relates to everything that you've been speaking about recently. I'm a rising senior, so obviously I'm looking hopefully for a job and a lot of retail companies um, pulled back their internships for this summer due to COVID-19. And a lot of word that I've been getting around, and to be honest, not people in leadership roles in the retail companies like you are right now, saying, Jolie, you really should stay away from retail. It's not doing great. Going to, I'm also a supply chain major, which is an easier practical route to work for a company that's selling toilet paper, selling shampoo, something that's still doing really well. How would, I guess, what is the best advice that you would really hone in on into defending yourself and saying that I want to stay in this passion, even though right now it looks a little bleak for someone entering the yeah. retail industry. Yeah. I, first of all, I would say to you that my personal belief is that this is a moment in time. And I, I do believe that that retail is going to come back. And I'm assuming when you say retail, you're thinking fashion retail. Yes. Yes. Fashion retail. So, so it, it, it's not going to go away, right? It just mm -hmm. it needs to stabilize. And you know what's interesting? I'll tell you something that um, because of the CARES Act and because of the stimulus check and the additional supplements on unemployment, mm -hmm. a lot of young people have been out of work and they've been paid more than they could make when they were working. So Abercrombie, American Eagle, um, urban they're flying their businesses are great That's true. so because they they have a, a group of customers who actually had a lot more money in their hand <laughs> than when they were working so now that could change but for the moment they are actually doing quite well and i would also say to you so you can find nuggets within retail mm -hmm. that that will be strong in this moment. Like there's a lot of talk about um, back to school is happening in a minute. Well, you guys all know that, um, but that's also in retail speak, you know, a big season and a big strong moment um, in business. And maybe there's an opportunity to start your career in a retail company that isn't necessarily an apparel clothing company, but is doing well in the moment. And then when retail is back, fashion retail is back, then you make your pivot and you make your change, mm -hmm. right? So as an example, um, the reason they're saying back to school is going to be really strong is because a lot of parents are thinking they're going to be homeschooling and parents are going to go buy supplies. They're going to go and buy desktop. They're going to go buy electronics. So there are industries in retail that are still doing quite well. And maybe for a moment, and again, this is back to like, it's not always a straight path, right? Like maybe for a moment, if that's the job you can get. And then when fashion retail comes back, you find your place, you go, and then you sell yourself and you say, well, I want to be in fashion retail. I did this because it's like, everyone's going to say during COVID-19, <laughs> right? Or after the pandemic, this is what I did. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's more important to get your foot in the door and start to learn the business of retail mm -hmm. than necessarily the fashion business of retail. And once you learn the business of retail, it's applicable across. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate this all. Yeah. Any other questions? A few minutes left or so. I think we're good. Lizanne, thank you so much. That was great. I learned a lot as well, of course. So that's always a plus. <laughs> 
uh, but we really appreciate you sharing your story, your experiences, your advice and suggestions. And, um, you know, it's truly invaluable to, to have that, that opportunity to do so. So thank you. Yeah. And I would say to you guys, you know, thanks for having me. I know it's crazy times, but sometimes during crazy times, opportunities and strength come out in ways that we have no idea. So just keep your eyes and ears open because you don't know where it's going to pop up, but it will. And then go for it. Um, you, you guys will find it. You'll find the right place. And again, just no, it's not always a straight path, but you got to get started and figure it out. And then sometimes you, if ultimately you have your goal set at this, whatever it is, then you'll find your way to get there and eventually you'll land there. Um, but know that it's not always just a straight path and that's actually okay. That's sometimes where you learn the most. And entering the market at this time, I mean, you will be the most resilient of them all, I believe, as you're learning how yeah. to kind of yeah. get yourself where you want to be. So you're going to have, be creative, you're going to be solution oriented. So I think there will be some positives that will come out of all yeah. of this. I it's not going to be easy. I mean, there's no doubt about it. This is a moment you guys were going to graduate into a moment where it was going to be the strongest job market ever. And now it's very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, but again, those are also the moments where you know, new ways of, of running a company, new, new up and coming uh, businesses and industries pop up, you know, things always happen when things are challenging, new opportunities show up and you, you guys have to keep an eye on what is that that's happening out there? What are some of those things that all of a sudden pop up and become really interesting and start to rise in a moment where other companies that maybe have been very traditional and well-known and good retail companies to work for, like maybe that's not the place to go. Maybe that's not the place to seek out, right? Like it might be some funky version of something that you thought, and then maybe that's the place to start and watch. Thank you again, Zan. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Good luck with the rest of your summer.